been very nice to meet a lot of you as we've gone uh, throughout the weekend. If I'm speaking too fast, just raise your hand and I promise I'll ignore you. Um, actually, I'll slow down. Um, but it's funny because I, uh, I did my training at, at University of Washington in Seattle, and then I did my otolaryngology residency in Houston, so I spent six years in Texas. And that's a real culture change. And uh, then I went on to Johns Hopkins for my fellowship, and one of the things I learned in Texas is that the Texans have a phrase for every problem to simplify it. Um, and uh, one of the phrases is, don't poke the skunk, because it just might spray. And uh, so that's the way of being controversial in Texas. We're going to poke a few skunks today. And my hope is in the talk to stimulate a lot of good conversation with you and also with a lot of the experts uh, that are here. So uh, this is actually a, a photograph taken of Mount Rainier, which is... Uh, my son and I actually climbed right here uh, last year, and it was a, a cloud formation that was reported to the local news service as a foreign intervention from an unidentified flying object, and it was just a cloud formation. Um, but one of the things is I'm talking about reconstructing versus using an OSU-integrated device in the modified cavity is a confession, and that is I haven't quite figured out the modified cavity yet. And I think there is certainly a hierarchy of disease control of the cholesteatoma, uh, or whatever the pathology is that you're treating. We also need to think about other, other tumors, uh, other things that can occur in the temporal bone. So treating the, the basic pathology first, and unfortunately hearing becomes a secondary issue. But a lot of these patients have a lot of hearing. So is it better to reconstruct them, or is it better to use a hearing aid, or is it better to use an osteointegrated device? And there's a lot of factors that roll into that. But one of the things that you have to watch out for, and I have a, a lot of patients from Alaska, uh, my last Alaska patient came down with a temporal bone fracture because a grizzly bear bit him on the side of the head. Uh, he was actually walking out of his house and the bear walked into his garage and bit him. And I said, well, what did you do? He said, what do you think I did? I played dead. You know, the bear was bigger than me. And I said, what did you learn from that? He said, carry a shotgun. I don't know, you know, stay out of the bear's way. But this is uh, how I view the modified radical cavity is it looks so simple, but there are some hidden challenges. So uh, be, be careful what you catch. So what I like to do is to prevent a stepwise planning format. And what I try to do is break things down in my head. And particularly in the teaching of residents and fellows, it's very important to be teaching a structure. I don't think that, and I think we learned this today, I don't think you can learn a particular surgery for a particular pathology. I think you learn a particular set of tools to address the pathology that you find. And the beauty of ear surgery uh, is that it's exciting and each case is, is uniquely different. But I like to present a stepwise approach for how I think about the modified radical cavity. And there's a couple of middle ear factors that people think about. Um, one of the things that I struggle with is when people present other people's data to their patients to talk them into surgery. The other thing is when people compare outcomes from two entirely different disease processes and criticize one uh, air bone gap so let's say from a stapedotomy outcome from a chronic ear. They're very different. And I think all of us would agree the toughest surgery to do oftentimes is chronic ear surgery. I do a lot of skull-based surgery and taking out an acoustic neuroma is much easier than getting a good hearing result in a modified cavity. But when you look at stapy surgery, you've got a normal tympanic membrane. Chronic ear surgery, typically, it's altered. So uh, uh, Monhart today was talking about you know, the thickening and the contracting of the tympanic membrane. We typically have normal middle ear mucosa in estapes. The mu middle ear mucosa can be missing, it can be edematous, uh, it can be infected, it can be diseased. Isn't it interesting how much infection you can have in the temporal bone and still do a primary reconstruction and have it heal because the ear has significant vascular flow? Um, and, uh, and just like sinus surgery, when sinus surgery first came out, um, I actually trained before the era of endoscopic sinus surgery, and uh, it was eradicate all the mucosa, eradicate all the disease. And sinus surgery is much more of a ballet now, where you open the drainage accesses and maintain the mucosa, just like the, the, the similar analogy can be made in the ear. Um, when you look at the stapes, you've got intact malleus and incus, and more importantly, the stabilizing ligaments and tendons, the tensor tympani tendon, the stapedial tendon, and the, and the ligaments above the head of the malleus and the incus are present. And all we're doing is really taking the arch away and keeping the entire hearing system intact. Where in chronic ear surgery, we have no idea what we'll be facing. 
Some of those ligaments may be damaged. The ossicles can be eroded. You have a quaternary lever mechanism in the stapes that's preserved. So all the lever mechanisms are preserved. The only thing you really lose is the sapedial tendon. The lever mechanism, by definition, in chronic ear surgery is very altered. So instead of trying to conquer chronic ear surgery, I would propose to you that we should dance with it. And, uh, and we should try to understand, uh, just like when you're fishing, you need to, if you're going to catch a trout, you have to think like a trout. If you're going to catch a whale in Alaska, you need a bigger fishing pole. So what about the assessment paradigm for osiculoplasty? So what I've done for my talk, since you're all, you've just had a wonderful lunch in a very warm tent with beautiful red wine. So this is going to be a picture presentation, so you all have to stay awake. Uh, but when you look at the external meatus, is it a, revi a revision uh, or a staged uh, reconstruction, or is it a new reconstruction? Uh, one of the, the largest complications that brings a patient back for a second operation, in, in my experience, is an inadequate meatoplasty. And uh, uh, Thibaut did an, a very nice meatoplasty yesterday, and it's very important to make the meatoplasty large enough. It doesn't have to be enormous. It has to be large enough to exteriorize the disease that you're exteriorizing. The tympanic membrane. Uh, oftentimes, the tympanic membrane in a modified radical cavity is very obscure. It doesn't look like a normal tympanic membrane. In a modified radical cavity, if I did not do the original operation, I CT scan nearly all of these because I want to understand what's going on in the middle ear. I had a very interesting case, which I will not show a picture of, of a gentleman that had a second stage reconstruction of a modified cavity with a, fif a 15 decibel air bone gap. And about two years after surgery, he had a large mass pop up on the side of his head. And I put a needle into it and pulled out squamous debris. And he had clusteotoma to the vertex of his skull going in the diploic space of his calvarium. And that's because they did a beautiful mastoidectomy and didn't drill out the zygomatic root. So they created the first, uh, pro the first error of not making sure they chased all the disease and eradicated it. So I actually had to remove the patient's uh, calvarium and reconstruct that. The next is what is the condition of the mastoid? And this is a patient whose mastoidectomy cavity looked very stable, was coming back for a second stage reconstruction, and I lifted the skin in the ear canal and it was completely filled with clusteotoma. And that clusteotoma had eroded in the lateral semicircular canal. So always be aware that there could be additional disease there. And this was actually picked up on a CT scan pre-op. Uh, what is the condition of the mucosa? Uh, you know, we had several lectures, people all talking about the absorptive capabilities, gas exchange, pressure utilization of the mucosa. Very important determinant in how you're going to reconstruct. And then finally, what is the condition of the ossicles and the tendons and the ligaments in the ear? Uh, this is an, an, an inside-out mastoidectomy I've done for a clusteotoma extending through the atatist ad antrum. And it's not it's not uncommon that you'll have the opportunity to preserve the ossicular chain even in a modified radical cavity. And if I can do that, I will do that. I will preserve the ossicular chain. And the, and the hearing outcomes are between about 15 and 20 decibels in my hands in that situation. So just because you're doing a modified cavity does not mean you'll necessarily lose the ossicles. Perichondrium or cartilage. Uh, temporalis. I mean, all the different materials we can use. Um, I haven't found any prosthetic material that I like better than temporalis uh, or cartilage or perichondrium. And I'm using a lot more cartilage now. Uh, 18 months ago, I didn't believe in thinning cartilage. And I went and spent some time uh, with Professor Zonert in Dresden and Alex Huber in Zurich. And they showed me through their laser vibrometry labs the importance of the actual thickness of the cartilage. So now I use cartilage routinely between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 uh, millimeters in thickness. And that will actually vibrate as a normal tympanic membrane. It will also give you thickness so that you can avoid extrusion uh, for your ossicular prosthesis. And you can use small pieces. You can use palisades of cartilage that was described when Jan Helms was still at Würzburg. Uh, whatever is your comfortable technique, it's very useful. This is a slide I borrowed from Professor Zonart. And you know, what is the ideal prosthesis? Well, the ideal prosthesis will actually transmit energy from the tympanic membrane through uh, per a parallel through the uh, implant to get the hydraulic mechanism uh, that, we, that we heard about earlier today. Um, it's very interesting that some of the prior reconstructions have really created a mechanical disadvantage for sound conduction to really empower that lever mechanism. And some of the dogma of middle ear reconstruction has been challenged. So uh, back in 1997, I wrote the chapter in Cummings' textbook for middle ear reconstruction with John DeParco. And we were very careful in our diagrams to show that we were tenting the tympanic membrane so that we could stabilize the prosthesis. Uh, 
Uh, and as we heard today, there's this tension between stability and actually preloading the stapes and losing low frequency hearing in your reconstruction. Well now, if you look at the data, um, contact with the malleus is just as effective as being under the malleus. And getting the tympanic membrane in contact with the prosthesis without additional tension gives you a better overall air bone gap in most situations. So um, the best prosthesis should be placed near the umbo. Um, it should be coupled, if possible, tightly to the stapes. I think the banding technique is, is one way to do that. I think there's some new prostheses that actually have uh, tighter fitting uh, connectors if you want to do a partial reconstruction as well. Um, the head size should be about two to three millimeters. Anything larger than that uh, really doesn't add mechanical advantage, but does add weight that can actually shift around and tip the prosthesis over over time. And a cartilage cap is, is very useful. If the cartilage is thin enough, you can use large pieces of cartilage, even in continuity of the external canal, or the, in the case of a modified cavity of the facial ridge, and still get good uh, hearing outcomes with, uh, with no real air bone gap attributed to the cartilage thickness. And the proper thickness to avoid preloading, but to ensure the best stability is critical, and there's different strategies. Uh, this is a nice uh, Professor Zahner diagram, where uh, in this particular situation, you would think that the best advantage would be a, a, a straight aligned prosthesis, but indeed the tympanic membrane is, is tilted inferiorly and rotated. So you really want to be in the plane, if you can, of the tympanic annulus. So this is a case I like to share as we go through some of these principles. And this is a 61-year-old female who presented to me with a left tympanic membrane perforation and chronic otorrhea. Her ear had been draining off and on, usually four to five times per year. It would drain for two to three months. Uh, for about the last six or seven years. She's had five prior tympanoplasties, and two of those had a mastoidectomy as well. And what you can see is that her right ear has essentially a, a moderate, mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, her left ear has very similar bone levels, but she has a significant conductive deficit, and this is what her tympanic membrane looked like. So when you're assessing the tympanic membrane, a dry perforation, a dry perforation plus moringosclerosis, and a perforation with granulation <laughs> tissue are three very different problems to contend with. And this implies that there's middle ear mucosa that's thickened and, and it's problematic. Uh, what I want you to pay attention to in her audiogram is not just the air and bone conduction levels, but the speech discrimination score, because that's what people really live for. So if you just look at her good ear, her right ear, she's a hearing aid candidate. So one of the questions is, can we improve or reduce the conductive deficit and make these people better hearing aid users? Is it better to use an osteointegrated implant? You know, a, a sound bridge, a Baja, something like that. So she underwent, uh, I presented her all the options, and she underwent a revision mastoidectomy resulting in a modified radical cavity. And this is her left ear, this is the tympanic segment of her facial nerve, and there's the vertical segment of her facial nerve. You can see she has very disrupted middle ear mucosa, very inflamed, um, and you can see where we've applied a laser to just remove uh, some of, the, some of the adhesions that were on her stapes. And, it, and, and this is a great case for a laser for chronic ear surgery because she had a mobile foot plate and a partially attached stapes. And by using the laser, we could just remove the posterior crus without disrupting the foot plate. The second thing we had to prove is that the foot plate was intact. In a lot of these cases, the foot plate can be thinned. And I've actually had a prosthesis. I, I put it on the uh, stapes foot plate about a month ago. I turned, was talking to my assistant, looked back and it had dropped all the way into the vestibule because the foot plate was merely a fibrous a remnant. And when I peeled the cholesteatoma off, I exposed an open oval window. So you have to be very careful. But these are, a lot of companies will actually give you sizers, but you really need to decide how high that prosthesis needs to be above the facial ridge. And my contention, my thesis would be, it needs to be about a millimeter above the promontory and just above the facial recess and you don't want it to tip. You want it to be stable so that it doesn't ankylose to either the facial nerve or the cochlear promontory. And the solution we came up with this particular patient was a total reconstruction prosthesis to a stable foot plate that was mobile. Um, and you can see the sizing of that. And the real trick to this is to get it so that it doesn't tip as the, as the ear scars and heals. And one trick that we used in this one, or that I used in this one, was to take a small piece of cartilage, punch a hole in it, put the prosthesis through the cartilage, and so the cartilage was basically uh, keeping the, it, touching the, the, both the facial nerve canal and the, and the cochlear promontory with the prosthesis going down the middle. We used a large piece of cartilage and a temporalis graft to reconstruct this lady's hearing. 
So we saw her back. Um, one other option, um, if, you, if you have a, a intact stapes, there are a lot of prostheses out there. Uh, the Grace Company has the Dornhofer prosthesis, which I used about 80% of my cases until the uh, prosthesis that Kurtz came out that actually has a flexible head. And the advantage is as the ear heals and shifts, there's a lot of scarring and movement and prostheses that are well placed can actually tip over. I think it was alluded to earlier that when you place a prosthesis, it's perfectly anatomically aligned with gravity, right? Because the patient's laying down. As soon as you stand up, it becomes perfectly perpendicular to gravity and the world starts working against you. So a little bit tighter fit on the capitulum and a head that you can actually place the prosthesis and then turn it and adjust it to how you want the cartilage to sit on your tympanic membrane, I have found very useful. Now, in all honesty, a full disclosure, I'm 18 months into using this prosthesis and uh, maybe I'll come back at some point and show you what our, our outcomes are. But the initial outcomes look a lot like this. Um, this is the lady post-op. So pre-op, I'll go back very quickly. This is her pre-op audiogram, about a 10, 20, 30, 40 to 45 decibel conductive hearing loss. She has very stable bone lines, and we really reduced her, her hearing loss at three months. And uh, what's very interesting is she's still at 100% speech discrimination, but we, went, we had to go a little higher in presentation level of the sound. So we used a, a TORP and I sized it to 1.7 millimeters in height. And her otorrhea resolved, and I just saw her before I came. I, we did an autogram on her about two weeks ago, and you can see that there's actually been in, increased closure in the low frequencies, and about a 10 decibel drop in the high frequencies. And Manhar was talking about some of the challenges with the high frequencies and the tympanic membrane, and I'm not sure what that means, but the moral of the story in this, and I tell this to all of our patients in chronic ear surgery, is that your hearing outcome won't be final for 12 to 24 months. You can continue to improve. In certain areas, this can drop. This patient is now a hearing aid user or a hearing aid candidate in both ears. Uh, the problem is she's having her most difficulty at the high frequencies, where in the English language, the high frequencies represent consonant sounds, and that's where they need the most hearing. Um, her hearing is uh, essentially the same uh, one year out. I think the real audiogram for her will be five years out to see what she's doing. And there's no signs of extrusion or recurrent infection. She has a dry cavity. So do you do modified cavities in one stage or two stages? And I think this is where I like to poke a skunk with all of the, uh, the faculty. And I base it, base it on a couple of variables. Number one is the degree of infection. And number two, which is related to number one, is what's the mucosal condition? If there's a lot of denuded mucosa, a lot of very infected mucosa, I'll stage the patients even in a modified cavity. Um, if, if, if it's reasonable, I can control it. Um, I'll try to reconstruct them and save them an operation, but never at the compromise of eradication of the cholesteatoma. Um, I love to, to put out to the faculty to use foot plate shoes. We have these foot plate shoes that are available. Um, in this particular situation, I like the Grace product better because the foot plate shoe is actually fixed. And in the modified cavities I've done, I've had two where the uh, the ball structure that you saw in an earlier talk separated. Um, I will say in one of those grace uh, patients, as the eardrum lateralized, it pulled the shoe off the foot plate and the conductive loss got greater. So like I said, um, if you really want to get humbled, start doing modified radical ear surgery for reconstruction. Um, this is another problem that really can't be taken too lightly, and I, have, and I alluded to this earlier. This is a cadaver bone on the right side. Here's the round window, the malleus, and here's the stapes foot plate. And People spend a lot of time looking at the middle ear, adjusting the ossicles, and forget to look at the stapes foot plate. Um, and I think it's very important, as we saw in the revision st stapedotomy today, to peel the tissue back and know exactly where the stapedotomy is. You need to know what's going on at the foot plate, and I typically will palpate that, not necessarily have to visualize it. But you have to be very careful. I learned this from Daryl Brackman. He said, you know, Doug, if you violate the labyrinth, the that's not, that's not as big a problem as if you try to figure out if you violated the labyrinth. Because what people will do is they'll keep suctioning, they'll suction the blood away, and when you just have an injury like this, it's no big deal until you suction the vestibule out. So palpate it, suction, if you, if you notice the suctioning today, it was very well done in the, mono, in the revision stapes because he suctioned adjacent to the oval window, never suctioned on the oval window. So you can actually, with your finger off the sucker, be very effective at identifying this, but you need to understand the status of the oval window. If the oval window is violated, I would recommend reconstructing it and staging it and coming back because you now have an exposed inner ear in an infected mastoid cavity.
and that's a problem. Um, what, what are the osteointegrated osteo implant opportunities? And I would say too many. Uh, I put this slide together uh, because one of the rules of PowerPoint is only have three points of data on any slide. But this is what we deal with every day in the clinic. A patient says, what options do we have? And it's like an attack of schizophrenia. You've got Baja, Ponto, Safono, all coming at you, Soundbridge, Bonebridge. Uh, and we have to explain these to patients, and it takes a lot of time. And uh, the, the overall indications, I think, are expanding. And as the implants themselves become more powerful, we're starting to use them for mixed hearing losses. So people like my lady actually might benefit from something like a bone bridge or potentially a Baja. But the bone conduction levels, uh, you, can, you can treat a, a complete conductive hearing loss with Baja, and the patient should come back to their sensory neural levels. Some of them will actually bump their sensory levels with a Baja or a Ponto. Um, this is the, uh, the Ponto. This is the Ponto Plus, which is a more high power. Um, cochlear has got the BP100, now the BP400. Uh, and this is actually the Baja Attract, which is a magnetic implant that really doesn't have the same power level. So if you want to trial a Baja Attractor or have your patients know the experience, have them put the soft band on because that's about what the Baja Attract will deliver. So we have a Starbucks. I live in Seattle. There's a Starbucks in every street corner, which is a coffee company. And uh, we send our patients to Starbucks with the headband on and we buy them a latte. They have to go down and order a latte because that's real life. You should not demo these soft bands with tones in a soundproof booth because it also picks up all the background noise and has to filter it. Uh, the Baja Attract, in my experience, hasn't been extraordinarily successful. I think I have about seven patients. And it really is a, an issue for children of not having something exposed that could be infected. For adults, they just don't want to have a post uh, coming through their skin. Um, if you look at the evolution of the implants, they've changed shape. Uh, the coating of the Baja with, uh, with the hydroxyapatite, I'm not so sure I believe that does anything. I can tell you that I've had very few Baja infections, and I've had more infections with the coated than the non-coated, and I think the infection rate is actually related to the length of the post. So if I've changed anything over the last few years, I've gone to the punch technique that we saw, which makes it about a seven-minute operation when you're really moving, um, and I've gone to longer fixtures. And, and the infection rate has gone, the overgrowth of skin rate has gone very far down. What's the trade-off? About two to three millimeters of exposed fixture on the patient. Uh, but I do a lot of skull-based surgery. We have a lot of Baja patients. The other thing is I would call a Baja uh, placement a very simple operation to do. I would call a Baja attract operation more significant because you actually have to anesthetize the patient, you've got to make a larger flap, and you really need to do that operation very specifically correct. What about conductive hearing loss and mixed hearing loss with Baja uh, versus hearing aids? And this was a study that was done in Sweden, and it shows that as you go up the frequency spectrum, um, the Baja can actually outperform a hearing aid, um, particularly with, in this case with conductive hearing loss. It's now being expanded to mixed hearing loss to where we're actually amplifying people in the high frequencies with a Baja quite successfully. I think the challenge is hearing aids are getting so good right now that they're doing a lot of amplification as well. And my hunch is that over the next 10 years, if I had a crystal ball and could predict the world, that we're going to have cochlear implant indications that intersect with hearing aid indications, and everything in between is going to be in special circumstances. So from a pure hearing perspective, even single-sided deafness, I think cochlear implants is going to be most likely where that lands. That's just my opinion. Safono, interesting. Everybody in America thought Safono was dead until Medtronic purchased them about two months ago. So Medtronic's back in the game. Um, Safono, uh, I believe, is a, is a bit larger operation. I think Safono is in the category of competing with Baja Attract. Um, and uh, I haven't done any Safonos. One of the issues Safonos had is with the platform and skin reactions. Uh, there's been some significant problems with that. So um, I'm not sure we'll, where Safono will end up. They're back in the game, and people are using Safono. Uh, bone bridge, I don't do bone bridges. They are not approved in the United States, um, but it's a very good device. The only, the, the good about bone bridge is it's extremely powerful. The tough part about bone bridge is uh, oftentimes it does require a, sc a, a skull thickness that you're not going to find in children. Uh, I do a lot of skull-based surgery. I know people will say I expose the dura all the time, and uh, you know you can expose the dura and put in a cochlear implant. You can expose the dura and put in a Baja. If it's a dominant hemisphere, I'm very nervous exposing the dura. Um, and if you look at where the Baja, um, excuse me, where the uh, bone bridge 
is ideally placed. It's ideally placed just anterior to the uh, sinodural junction. And, uh, and it gets back to my Texas phrase. Uh, be careful when you're there, because that's a skunk that you can poke without knowing it. And it may not even be anything you realize. Uh, these these uh, if patients can wake up slowly from anesthetic, and they can have a clot there just by putting compression externally on it. So be very careful about that. I think it's a very good device. It's the floating mass transducer effect. I think Medell's next iteration should make it a goal to make that a smaller mass transducer. This is the sound bite. So this is a Baja-like device that you place on the teeth. This company officially went bankrupt about four months ago in the United States. So I'm not sure what's going to happen with Sophono. I mean, excuse me, with Soundbite. I have one patient who truly hates his device. Um, so uh, it's, it's lunch. We've got to keep you awake. Um, and I know yesterday I failed. I've actually been photographed in REM3 sleep in the third row back there. Um, but I think there's a very systemic approach. And I think you've heard it. I've been paying attention to all the surgeons that have been speaking about ear disease in the past couple of days, people think about it the same way, very, very systematically. What does the tympanic membrane look like? What does the mucosa look like? What is the condition of the ossicles, both in continuity and mobility? Is there tympanosclerosis? We saw that in the operating room yesterday. Tympanosclerosis is different than tympanosclerosis, and one does not imply the other. Um, what is the condition of that mucosa? And do you stage or do you not stage? I do think that over time, the role of osteo-integrated implants, osteo implants will provide options for people who will not do well with surgical reconstruction. And, and I would consider my, my modified case I showed you uh, to be a pretty good outcome. Um, but that's a pretty good outcome. You know, it's still not great hearing. And, and my next plans for that lady is to put a hearing aid in her good ear. And uh, we'll see how she does before we do anything with the opposite ear. So. Uh, you are all welcome to come to Seattle anytime. This is my email. And this is what Seattle looks like two days a year. So it's uh, quite beautiful. And I want to tell you that right here, the most important building, see that little tower there? My office is right there. So yeah, you're all welcome to come. And thank you very much for letting me be part of this group. I'm sure you have some questions for Doug. Any questions? Um, Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, so I, I mostly uh, agree with you. I've done most of the, all of those technologies, quite a lot of them as well. But one thing I just wanted to make a comment on was that, uh, you know, sometimes people won't try and close the air bone gap if there's a bone curve uh, loss as well, thinking they're going to wear a hearing aid anyway. Why not just go straight to a hearing aid? But it's worth pointing out that you know we think hearing is in a log uh, framework, so you know five six dBs is not a big change, but hearing is working in a linear framework. So a six dB improvement in hearing means that you can get half the power. You can, the battery life can be double, it can be half the power. It can distortion can go down significantly. So putting a hearing aid into a thirty dB conductive loss that has to overcome is very different. Putting in a ten dB conductive loss that has to overcome. Right. So the, the hearing aid space is linear, whereas the hearing, aid, where the hearing space is actually log. So those things do make a difference to the hearing aid function afterwards, even if they're going to wear a hearing aid afterwards. Not to mention that you, know, you can also make the ear healthier because they don't get discharged and things like that. <laughs> I think uh, one place we see that quite a lot that we're going to hear about in the course is the far advanced otosclerotic. And do you do a stapedotomy to improve the air bone gap? And I've actually seen speech discrimination scores come up significantly just by reducing the conductive deficit without a hearing aid. And then they were able to wear a hearing aid where they weren't before. So I, I agree. I think there's, it's a nonlinear, and 6 dB is a big deal. Thank you.